Thank you, uh, Professor Bichumar. It's a very, uh, very, very, uh, what is important uh, presentation as far as the sustainable uh, goal achievement is concerned through fisheries and also addressing the nutritional security of uh, uh, not only our nation but also world over. It's a very serious issue. Uh, when I read through certain papers, it is uh, there is a sentence: "Nutritions are uh, slipping between the fingers of the most needed one." It's very, very, very relevant because uh, the small-scale fisheries they were not uh, seen. Their work is not uh, considered, but it's a major chunk of the and part of the fisheries, uh, especially when we consider the nutritional security of the nation. So thank you for the presentation, and uh, I request the participants to. Uh, write your comments, questions, or anything into the uh, chat box so that the people interested with them they can go through that and uh, they collect it. Okay, then we will go for the next presentation. Uh, that is by Dr. Sunil Mohammed. Uh, uh, Sunil Mohammed will deal with the, the topic towards sustainability in marine fisheries of India. Okay. Sunil, please start. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sashi. Um, so, uh, I hope my screen is uh, visible. Yeah. Uh, let me just make it uh, full screen. We can see. We can see. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you, moderator and uh, other panelists, and also all the participants. Uh, very warm good evening to all of you. Can you uh, make it full screen so that we can see it? Uh, I thought I was in full screen. Is okay. it not? Is yeah. it full screen? Are you able to see it? Uh, no. No. No, I think. We can see it anyway. Okay. Yeah, just one sec. Uh, uh, is it full screen now? Uh, no, it's no, not. Sir. It's not in full screen, sir. It's not in full screen. I think you can uh, how that. Uh... Ah, anyway, okay, we can read it anyway. Okay. Okay, I, I think I will not waste time. I hope that uh, many of you can see the screen. Uh, so I will be talking about sustainability. Uh, uh, and many of the previous speakers have some uh, touched upon some of the aspects of this. So seafood is one of the most uh, uh, highly traded commodity in the world, uh, much more than coffee or sugar or other commodities. So uh, it has got a wide acceptance throughout the world. And if you look at the role of developing countries in fish trade, uh, it was about 39% in 1976, and it's grown to more than 60% now uh, in 2016. And also, I think many of the previous speakers have been talking about the consumption and the importance to nutrition, uh, human nutrition, uh, so, in 1960s, the per capita consumption, global per capita, was about 10 kilo, and now the average is around 2000. Uh, in 2018, it's about 22 kilo. And as uh, NKS was telling, uh, in Kerala, it's about 30 kilo. But uh, the rest of India, uh, it's so variable. I will again come back to it. So, uh, a significant proportion uh, of the global uh, intake of animal protein is from seafood. And you can also see that uh, capture fisheries or wild harvest uh, is decreasing over a period of time. Uh, where it was around 94% in 1960s. It's now come down to uh, actually aquaculture has now overtaken uh, wild harvest. Uh, aquaculture now contributes nearly 52% of the global uh, seafood production. 
and if we again uh, look at what is the sustainability what is this uh, so this uh, term was coined in 1992 uh, by uh, officially coined by the united nations conference on environment and development and there has been overwhelming support for this from uh, all over the world uh, so it can mean to hold up or to bear to support to keep going to prolong uh so many meanings are there for sustainability but uh, in the fisheries context it's so important uh, all these meanings uh, are important is not only to sustain life uh, of uh, the people engaged in fishing it's also to, uh, uh sustain the uh, resources and sustainable development <clears throat> Right. Yeah. Is that that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations uh, to meet their own needs? Uh, this is a very uh, uh, common definition that now we have, and it's uh, universally accepted. And if you look at the dimensions of sustainability, you have the social, economic, and the environment. And uh, when all these are coming together in an equitable viable and bearable manner you have sustainability and uh, it's so important now that in 2019 uh, the fao had a world conference on fisheries sustainability and it was about strengthening the science policy nexus uh, although science can be good uh, unless it is uh, turned into policy and practiced it is not beneficial to people so uh, sustainability involves social economic and environmental uh, issues and this slide has also been shown by uh, sir, uh, sir you are not changing your slide sir i am changing my slide uh, but i think you are not seeing is is it visible now it's okay now sir okay uh, okay so uh, so these are the dimensions of sustainability and the sustainable development goals where we are uh, more concerned with uh, sdg 14 which is life under water uh, where but others also have uh, importance in fisheries and if you this is a very famous uh, graph on sustainability of our uh, exploitation of resources uh, the top Uh, orange color you can see is overfished or unsustainable and you have the middle uh, 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 graph you have the sustainable uh, resources and you can see that the underfished uh, resources are now very very few so uh, although sustainable resources are increasing we also see that unsustainable part is also equally there it's also increasing uh so uh, this is a lot matter of big concern for everybody and coming to the profile of indian marine fisheries uh, these are the physical like assets i will not go into the details of it but what is more important is the marine fishermen population which is nearly 4 million people out of which uh, about a million people are active fishermen and the number of crafts uh, uh, more than 200000 crafts uh and a, few, a large coastline and 2 2.02 million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone so we have immense assets with us uh and uh if you look at our seas we have um, two island territories nine maritime states the arabian sea the bay of bengal special ecosystems like the gulf of kutch gulf of kambar gulf of manar park bay sundarbans so all these are part of uh the assets that we have and uh, the value of our fisheries is now more than 11 billion us dollars we export nearly 5 and 1/2 billion but it now the proportion of uh, uh captured fisheries is about 45% the export volume is nearly 1 million ton 3% of total exports and domestic markets are 81% fresh and the rest is frozen dry and fish meat and here again you can see fish meat uh, per capita fish consumption is uh, very low uh, so average is very low but the range is very high it can uh, be as high as 39 kg in the lakshadweep per person per year so uh, the share in gdp is about 1% and more than 5% in agriculture gdp so fisheries is definitely a very important part of our economics uh, scenario 
and you can see right from 1950s our fish catches have been growing uh, with ups and downs and uh, right now it's about uh, th uh, more than three and a half million tons uh, whereas the uh, potential is about four and a half million tons uh, uh, and you can see that the growth graph if you see you can see the growth rate is increasing for uh, India's marine fish production but uh, the world's marine fish production we have a negative growth and this is mainly because of our resources are highly fecund very fast growing uh, uh, and quick turnover of generations so uh, there's quite a bit of resilience in our fish stocks uh, some of the major resources in 2018 are mackerel, cephalopods, shrimps, uh, ribbon fish, uh, and you can see the oil sardine, which uh, was nearly 25% of the total resources in about five, six years ago, has now got reduced to about less than 5%. So these are uh, some of the dynamic nature of our fisheries. And uh, we have a number of gears. The, mo mo the very important factor is that there are about 30 craft gear combinations. So it can be a motorized gill net or a mechanized gill net or a non-motorized gill net. So uh, these combinations of vessels make it a very complex uh, system to manage. Uh, and uh, you can see that the mechanized sector now contributes more than 80%, the motorized about 17% and non-mechanized just about 1%. And trawl is the major uh, gear which contributes about 50%. Uh, the ring scene and persine together about 15%, gill nets about 12 and roll nets 9%. So trawl, uh, which is a, probably a ecologically destructive gear, but it contributes maximum to our catches. And another important factor is that we have high species diversity in our catch. Uh, this is a comparison between 2017 and 18, and you can see uh, Tamil Nadu has the maximum diversity, uh, the number of species that are caught. In uh, 2017, it was 488, and in 2018, it was 564. Next comes Kerala uh, with around 400 and odd species. So uh, you can see that uh, we catch uh, quite a large number of species. And that again makes it more difficult to identify what is the target uh, of each fisheries what is um, bycatch, all these things become much more complex to decide. So in this particular uh, uh, slide, I show you uh, one, two gears, multi-day trawl net and, multi and mechanized trawl net, which is the small trawl trawlers. And you can see that the 22 target species and non-targets are 580 species and total species about 600 species. So. Uh, we have a huge diversity in our catch and we have a system of recording it uh, and which unlike any other part of the world. Uh, so it, it makes it much more complex for us to manage. And about this, the resources also have diverse biological characteristics. So some of them have fast growth and high fecundity. Uh, some have fast growth and low fecundity like cephalopods. Some have slow growth and high fecundity like spiny lobsters and slow growth and low fecundity like elasmobranchs, the sharks, skates, and rays. And also uh, the shapes are so different. Some of them get easily caught in the net. Some can escape easily. Some are viviparous, some are schooling, migratory, sex transformation, semel parity. So many different types of life histories. All these makes uh, fisheries management also much more complex. What to manage, how to manage, all becomes very important questions. And again, this is a recent study where we look at resilience and vulnerability of fish stocks and project it uh, over a graph. And you can see that the uh, brown, uh, which is the elasmobranchs, uh, are highly vulnerable and have low resilience. Whereas majority of the crustaceans, which are the light blue color have uh, low vulnerability and high resilience. So uh, uh, this is another important aspect of our uh, resources uh, characteristics. Uh, and this makes our uh, fisheries much more resilient in, resilient in the long run. Okay.
So uh, again, we need to look at why we need to conserve and manage fisheries. Although fisheries is uh, defined as not only the species, but also the people involved and the boats involved and the ecosystem. Everything together is species, uh, is the fisheries. And most importantly, it is unseen. It is a resource which is underwater. So we do not know what is there, how much we can catch. Uh, and these are important facets of fisheries management. And to whom does this belong to? Uh, although uh, many fishermen would claim it is theirs, the fact that uh, the governments make law to govern fisheries mean that, means that it belongs to all the people of the country. So, uh, uh, so fisheries management is a very complex subject. And in order to protect the fishery resources, you need to make it sustainable. That is, you can continue to get what we are getting now. And, uh, and in order to do that, sometimes we have to undertake what is called as a precautionary principle. Precautionary is a term which is when we do not have sufficient knowledge about fisheries, even though we don't have that knowledge, we take decision uh, from a conservation and sustainable aspect. So here you have the power bill, two frogs in the uh, frying pan, and one frog says, unless I have proof that I will be boiled alive, I will not get out of it. The other frog says, uh, we should get out because uh, unless we have uh, proof that we'll be boiled, uh, we need not wait for that. So uh, the precautionary principle does not wait for the burden of proof. Uh, sometimes we have to take decisions based on available knowledge. And when we invest in sustainability, we can get 40% more higher, uh, some estimates put 40% more higher catches, uh, then uh, the value can be increased by about 200%. Uh, more people can be more uh, sustainably employed, uh, so there are everything is advantages when we are moving into sustainable fisheries. But how can we do this? Uh, that's the issue. So uh, some of the uh, global bodies have been making studies on how fisheries is managed throughout the world. And here you can see a list of um, uh, countries where fisheries management is uh, assessed on the basis of research, management, enforcement, socioeconomics, and stock status. And India is probably at the bottom part, but uh, you can see that in research, it scores pretty high, but in terms of uh, stock status, enforcement, management, uh, and socioeconomics, it scores poorly. Uh, you can see all the developed countries at the top, like United States, States Iceland, Norway, Russia, etc. So uh, this is uh, an important thing for us to realize how where we are and how we can progress in future. So fisheries uh, is a, uh, both a state and central subject as per the constitution of India, and is also mostly open access. Uh, as per international classification, mostly small scale, but uh, actually we have the liberty to uh, decide what is small scale and what is not. Uh, I would say that uh, we are not all small scale. Uh, some part of our fisheries, especially the mechanized sector, is reasonably large scale. We have a number of laws, I'm not going into the detail, and this again makes it more complex. So basically fisheries laws are those which are in the 12 nautical mile area of the territorial waters, which are the st uh, state managed area. Each state has a Marine Fisheries Regulation Act. Whereas the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone, the 12 to 200 zone does not have a law for managing fisheries as of now, but it has certain other laws like the maritime zones of India, uh, then several other uh, laws also impinge on this, uh, like the Environmental Protection Act, Indian Wildlife Protection Act, the Biological Diversity Act, the Coastal Regulation Zone Act, uh, or part of the Environmental Protection Act. So uh, several laws also make law enforcement and uh, compliance to law uh, very difficult. Uh, some of the regulatory measures to ensure sustainability, we generally classify them as input and output controls. Uh, input controls are vessel registrations, fishing licenses, which the Department of Fisheries does. There's a closed fishing season, like the fishing ban or troll ban. There's a closed fishing areas, like marine protected areas, or gear specification size of, and mesh size of nets, control over destructive fishing practices. And in output control, we have minimum legal size, 
protected species uh, like the uh, endangered threatened and protected species under the indian wildlife protection act so uh, a, a, we can also call these as technical measures uh, like gear restrictions prohibited gears and fishing methods gear size and mesh size all these uh, for example the government of kerala through the kerala marine fisheries regulation act uh, uh, enforces many of these things uh, some of the areas re area restriction and time restriction some of the areas are earmarked for traditional fishes seasonal fishing ban uh, for, and then the uh, output uh, regulation of size restriction on minimum legal size so uh, in 2017 the government of india brought out the national policy on marine fisheries and it has a vision statement which has sustainability built in that is the statement says a healthy and vibrant marine fishery sector that meets the need of the present and future generation so uh, this uh, statement actually uh, is all about sustainability i'm not going into the details of the policy uh, but uh, fisheries management plans are essential for managing fisheries but an important thing is from the management plan we need to develop control rules and we do not have any control rules at, at present and also enforcement is poor but improving uh, so uh, management plans are necessary uh, to be developed and then the control rules have to be developed by the state uh also the global body like the fao has developed what is known as the ccrf or the code of conduct for responsible fisheries uh which has been indianized uh, into what is known as the indian marine fisheries code how how the 220 articles in the uh, ccrf can be uh, 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 employed in the indian context who will do what and how so this is an important uh, publication to guide the government on how the uh, CCRF can be implemented. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, we also have, uh, I think some of you have touched upon the uh, fishing for juveniles and now many people now call it as fishing for catastrophe because uh, actually we are uh, emptying our seas of these young ones in order to feed uh, the shrimp farming industry. And it is an unsustainable practice uh, which uh, has serious consequences. And the government has, to some extent, tried to control this uh, through the Minimum Legal Size Act, uh, especially the government of Kerala. Uh, the CMFRA has advised uh, 58 species uh, for minimum legal size in Kerala and it is implemented uh, in Karnataka 72 species in Tamil Nadu uh, 113 species Andhra Pradesh 61 and Maharashtra 48 but uh, many of these states have not implemented this uh, Kerala has done this uh, and also enforcing it pretty strictly we also have uh, very high over capacity and uh, the CCR of FAO says that states should prevent overfishing capacity should implement management to ensure that fishing effort is commensurate with the capacity uh, of fishery resources and their sustainable utilization the picture that you see is of uh, chinese dip nets in vembanad lake and you can see how closely packed they are and over capacity is as high as 400 percent in some sectors in the country so we really need to bring down the number of vessels and uh, Kerala government has again taken the lead. It has declared a moratorium on new fishing crafts for the next 10 years. And it has also declared registration, uh, uh, mandatory registration of boat building yards. And only replacement of boats would be allowed and no new boats would be allowed. So uh, these are steps towards um, uh, bringing down overcapacity. And also fishery scientists are generally classify fish stocks based on what we call as the Kobe plot, where we classify fish based on whether it is overfished or overfishing or underfished or underfishing. So, uh, so it's a color coded uh, chart where green indicates underfishing and orange or yellow indicates overfishing, but the stock is pretty good but stock is low and also high effort means it's in the red. 
you can see that uh, many stocks uh, are in the red but because of our high species diversity we are able to overcome and uh, continue to increase our yields but it's not so in many states okay and also uh, spatial regulations in order to manage a resource a, a aquatic resource you need to also set out where you are managing so uh, uh, spatial management is very important uh, and of course the 12 nautical mile which the kerala government controls all state government controls uh, is important but the rest of the 12 to 200 nautical mile is also important where where uh, regulations are uh, less I, yeah i will my friend the jeremy cold is on loan for the yes you are the leader and i am saying that his attitude of course that's a sorry and it's a little but he did let it happen and encourage and without necessarily discuss uh i don't know some uh, some uh, case some disturbance uh, so okay so uh, you are going to finish yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. i'll be finishing this so okay. uh fisheries regulations must be area based and we have given advice on that and also regulations on co management uh, government uh, actually uh, are finding it governments are actually finding it very difficult to manage fishery problems and unless there is involvement of the fishermen uh, many problems will persist so without the agreement of fishermen on the laws uh, that you make uh, enforcement and compliance would be very difficult and again kerala has taken the lead and has uh, amended its law and has created a three tier uh, management system known as fisheries management council there's village district and state council i think uh, to some extent this was already been covered and we have gone further and advocated this to the national level where there would be a national council there would be regional councils based on area uh, like the northeast arabian sea southeast arabian sea and of course the state has uh, its own three tiered system so uh, we need to do this because the area management is very important so you can see that um, we have divided the two, 12 to 200 nautical mile into uh, northeast arabian sea southeast arabian sea so for example southeast arabian sea has goa karnataka and kerala uh, uh, and the lakshadweep is different so uh, the the area that uh, is there for each of these uh, uh, management zones are given here i'm not going into the detail and we have educated councils for each of these uh, areas uh, like for example the gujarat state fisheries management council like that so uh, these councils are necessary to make management um, more participatory uh, and also compliance uh, much more easier another aspect is the protected areas and medical ma zones which are necessary to ensure sustainability of some of the stocks uh, again i am not going into the details uh, the another important new development is that of eco labels and which actually rewards uh, sustainable fisheries and there are several and this is again uh, this development is a market based uh, 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 intervention and this has happened because the pace of regulatory measures to curb overfishing by countries has is very poor and therefore private market mechanisms that is the people have a choice to buy i will buy only sustainably caught fish and uh, in order to ensure that what you are getting is sustainably caught several eco labels have come into existence like for example the best aquaculture practice the msc marine stewardship council the aquaculture stewardship council the global seafood sustainability initiative dolphin safe so eco, eco labels are a market based mechanism which is growing uh, uh, in all over the world and uh, and many buyers are now demanding only eco labeled or certified fishery products i'll show you an example of msc certified catch uh, global catch so now you have nearly 12 million tons or 15% of the global fish catch is now msc certified and there are 41 countries where uh, certification is happening uh, uh, so you can see that the graph is going up uh, so uh, this is a new development in the uh, fisheries sustainability so do indian fisheries need such, uh, such certification in 2010 uh, we have started working on this and 2014 a small scale fishery is a short neck clam 
uh, fishery of Ashtamudi Lake became the first MSC certified fisheries in India. And after that, nearly 12 fisheries in India are now moving towards uh, MSC certification. This uh, is not an easy process, it's a long process where and a lot of stakeholders are involved uh, in this process, uh, including the government, the NGOs, the academic uh, organizations, and the research institutions. So you can see uh, the gillnet caught blue swimming crab in Tamil Nadu, the troll caught octopus, cuttlefish, and squid, the troll caught uh, karikadi shrimp, uh, uh, and pollen line caught skip, skipjack tuna. So several, there are more than 12 species that are now moving towards MSC certification. Thank you for this opportunity to present this and for hearing this. I would like to thank the Association of Fisheries Graduates for giving me this opportunity. I'm sorry if I have overstepped my time a little bit. Thank you.